This is Covering the Spread, part of the FanDuel Podcast Network. Pretty fun week eight coming up on tap where it may not be the most thrilling games, but still some fun storylines to track, some fun players we get to see in fun situations, and that could lead to some good prop betting. We're going to have JJ Zacharyson of LateRound.com on to break down his favorite props for week number eight over at FanDuel Sportsbook. This is covering the spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and NumberFire.com. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a senior writer and analyst for NumberFire.com. Joined here once again by JJ Zacharyson. Find him on Twitter at LateRound. QB. Check out LateRound.com for all of his work and also the Late Round Fantasy Football Podcast. JJ, we are on to week eight. How are you doing today? I'm good. I, I'm still hoping that Thursday night football uh, will be abolished at some point in, in our future, but I, I don't think that's going to happen. It's just been bad football on Thursday nights and it's uh, it's just been it's been tough to watch. Yeah. I agree, given that I had the Bucks money line. So I'm not mm. really opposed to this this edict by any means. Also, I have the Bengals money line before the Jamar Chase news. So we're off to just a roaring. It was a great four hour stretch to go from the Jamar Chase news to the Bucks losing in disappointing fashion, even with Mark Andrews and Rashad Bateman not playing most of that game. Yeah, it feels like every time I publish rankings each week, there's a huge news item that breaks uh-huh. literally 15 minutes after I get everything done. And that was the right. Jamar Chase news this week. And it's not even like you can just like, OK, take out Jamar Chase. You have to like alter yeah, every exactly. single player on the Bengals to yeah, account exactly. for it, which is just uh, a true delight. I am happy I don't have that job. Uh, I yeah. don't have to deal with uh, weekly rankings for sure. We'll dive into week eight with JJ, get his thoughts on some props this week and situations to monitor. But first, a reminder to make sure you are subscribed to Covering the Spread. Our week eight NFL money line spreads and totals podcast is up with Ryan Williams breaking down our favorite bets for this week outside of the Bucks. Hopefully they go better than those. And also our college football week nine podcast with Ed Fang and also Austin Swain swung by uh, from number fire to talk with us about college football. Get those up on the, the covering the spread podcast feed and on the FanDuel YouTube page. The week eight NFL Sunday million for daily fantasy is officially live on FanDuel showcase your NFL knowledge and construct your best nine player roster while staying under the salary cap. Then follow along using FanDuel's live scoring feature to compete for your share of $1.4 million in cash prizes, including $250,000 to first place, all for just a $5 entry fee with superstars like Cooper Cup, Jalen Hurts, and Saquon Barkley all scheduled to take the field on uh, this Sunday. There is no shortage of big names for you to build your lineups around. NFL season is approaching It's already here. Uh, Anyway, uh, the NFL week number eight is approaching quickly. So head to FanDuel.com and submit your lineup today. Eligibility restrictions apply. Go to FanDuel.com or download the FanDuel app for more details. Now let's dig in here to week number eight, JJ. And I think one of the storylines that we can take and kind of make more broad is Sam Ellinger becoming the starting quarterback here for the Colts. And, you know, that's whatever it is. It's a a one week thing. It's, It's his first career start. But I think the broader point is rushing quarterbacks because Ellinger is far more mobile than Matt Ryan. And you've done research in the past on the impact that has on fantasy football and what that does. But obviously a lot of that research can translate to betting props too. So what did you learn there and how do you think that applies to betting props in a situation like this? Yeah, look, I, I think it's kind of obvious, um, but I don't think people think about it enough, if that makes sense. But, mm-hmm. uh, you know, mobile quarterbacks are generally bad for both their running backs and their pass catchers. Now, I should say with the running back thing, uh, running backs are typically a little bit more efficient when they have these mobile quarterbacks, which makes total sense because defenses have to be, you know, they're, they're, they're kept honest uh, based on the, the threat of the quarterback. And so, you know, we've seen, you know, crazy yards per carry averages, for instance, out of Baltimore since Lamar Jackson took over. That's a perfect example. Uh, you've even seen it, you know, the, the efficiency on the ground with like a team like Atlanta or Chicago, uh, even though, you know, those quarterbacks aren't that great through the air. They haven't been that efficient through the air. You can still see good efficiency on the ground because of that threat. The issue with running backs from the standpoint of fantasy football and how that might affect even prop bets is that those types of quarterbacks generally don't check down as much. Mm -hmm. Um, But it's it's sort of this compounding effect where, you know, teams only have a certain number of plays that they're going to run in a, in a single game, right? Like just generally speaking. And so if those plays, if some of those plays, if a chunk of those plays are going to quarterback rushes, then that means the other personnel on that team are no longer seeing those plays. That's really what this comes down to. And so what that means is, uh, you know, receivers and pass catchers, 
they also don't benefit as much uh, from these mobile quarterbacks. You know, pocket passers are better for wide receivers, for instance, from a yardage standpoint, et cetera, because, uh, you know, these, these quarterbacks are, are those, those pocket quarterbacks are standing back in the pocket. These mobile right. quarterbacks are taking off and using one of those plays for themselves, essentially. Um, the other thing to keep in mind too, is touchdown equity, uh, you know, closer to the end zone, running backs won't get as many, as much love close to the end zone uh, as uh, they would with, with a more pocket passer. So that's something to keep in mind as well. The, the one thing I will say with Ellinger uh, with Ellinger and, and the, uh, the, the Colts offense is that, you know, I, I do think this is a little bit different of a situation because the replacement uh, the, or the player that he's replacing wasn't pushing the ball down the field at all. He had like a no. 7% 15 plus air yard rate, which was the lowest in the league. And so, you know, part of the reason they're making the shift is because they want more explosive plays. And so I do think it's more of a moot point from the standpoint of like yardage and, and looking at that, because you're hoping that, you know, Ellinger will push it down the field more than Matt Ryan did. So, you know, most cases, and I still think that generally speaking, like this is probably a lot worse for a guy like Jonathan Taylor, who's coming off his highest target share of his career and, and having, you know, one of the highest uh, target totals of his career. Um, you know, that that's, that's a big deal going to a, a mobile quarterback who might not check down as much, but someone like Michael Pittman, who's not seeing deep balls to begin with, it probably doesn't matter that much because what if he starts seeing these deep balls now that Matt Ryan, um, you know, is, is no longer under center, but that's generally the gist of it is that these mobile quarterbacks, they take away plays in the, in their team's offense for themselves. And that can hurt the rest of the, uh, the personnel in that, that offense. And the check down element you mentioned is important here too, because when we saw Ellinger in the preseason, he had a 9.4 yard a dot. He was throwing the ball downfield is across like 24 or 26 throws. So not a huge sample, but um, that would impact the check downs for JT impact the check downs for Naheem Hines, but then also potentially wind up being a wash for guys like Pittman because they might get more downfield work, right. but less volume overall. So maybe like a catch prop, it could be downgraded there, but the yardage prop may wind up being a wash. Right. Other thing that's important entering week number eight is I feel like there are a lot of really super rush heavy offenses this year. Like we've got Atlanta. You mentioned, you mentioned Chicago as well. The jets have kind of been this way recently too. And they're almost outliers, at least the, the Falcons and the Bears are, in terms of how run heavy they are relative to what we've seen here recently. And when you're making projections, you take it from a top down approach. Do you expect some sort of regression towards like a quote unquote normal approach with those teams? Or is a sample of six or seven games now big enough where we can say they're going to be an outlier going forward as well? I think some teams there's expected regression. You know, I, I would even consider the Jets to some degree yeah. some expected regression because you can see how these teams are performing in more neutral game scripts. And yeah, you know, they are a more run heavy team, but nothing, nothing, Jim, is like Atlanta and Chicago. Like yeah. I've I've never seen this in my decade of analyzing this stuff yeah. as my job. We just have we we haven't seen this. Um we have samples of both the Bears and the Falcons uh, when trailing this year, by trailing by a lot of points, 10 plus points. Um, just to give you some context, Atlanta has run 111 plays this year while trailing by 10 or more points. And on those plays, if you're looking at pass rate from the perspective of pass attempts divided by total pass and rush attempts instead of dropbacks, so you're just looking at total attempts here, they have a 45% pass rate while trailing by 10 <laughs> or more points which is absolutely insane. The crazier part is the Bears, while trailing by 10 or more points, they've run 54 plays. Their pass rate is 38%. Wow. Only the Falcons, Bears, and Eagles have a total pass rate under 45% this season from an overall perspective. So right. basically what, what's going on here is that the Bears and the Falcons are still the most run-heavy teams in football when they've been trailing by 10 or more points this season, which, I mean, moving forward, you just have to expect that's the case. I think... For Atlanta in particular, last week was really sort of like this litmus test for us to see, right. okay, they're likely going to trail against Cincinnati. They're on the road. They're facing an offense that's been throwing the ball a lot, and they have all these weapons. And, you know, Atlanta's secondary has been suspect. And what did we see? We saw this negative game script immediately in that game. And then what did we see? We saw a run-heavy script from Atlanta. I mean, it's just, it's one of those things where they clearly don't trust Marcus Mariota. Um, you know, we're seeing the, the Bears at least open it up a little bit more. Um, and so I'm looking at those kinds of trends because offenses do evolve as the season goes on. I mean, you know, Chicago was a lot more conservative to start the year. Now they're opening things up a little bit more with Justin Fields. And they're realizing, too, that when you drop back to pass, that also opens things up for Fields to scramble. He's had more scrambles too, not just design runs, you know, over the last month or so. Um, and so, you know, that's good from Chicago standpoint. But overall, I mean, both of these teams are very, very run heavy. And at this point, even when you factor in game script, you have to assume that they're still going to be run heavy. And 
you know, Atlanta in particular is really interesting because they have a really easy schedule, uh, you know, from here on out, especially in the short term. And, you know, even this week, they're, they're decent favorites against Carolina. So we should expect them to just run, 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 because that's what they've been doing. Yeah. And I think that if they show you what they want to do, you should believe them. And the yeah. question is, you know, will sports books react enough to account for the fact they are projected to continue to be an outlier? You know, you have to judge that for yourself, you know, open up the props for those teams, see what you see and, you know, kind of bank on them still being what they've been because it's been a long enough sample now to know this is exactly what they want to do. And as long as they can, they're going to keep on doing it. Yeah. And the other thing too, is I know that it's frustrating if you play fantasy football or if you like Drake London or Kyle Pitts, but entering that game last week in Cincinnati, Atlanta's offense had not been that bad, especially when you consider no. the personnel that they have just from like a expected points added standpoint per play, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot of people screaming, Oh, Arthur Smith's got to go, but they're sitting in a pretty decent position right now <laughs> in that division, and they're not going to change things. They could up be a game they... up on second place if they win on Sunday. Yeah, ex exactly, exactly. Like they're like this is not a situation where they're a one-win team and they're not competitive. Right. I mean, they've been competitive this year by running this offense, and so even if it's because of this, I mean, we we know how coaches think in the NFL. We know how front offices think. They don't necessarily understand correlation and causality. And so yeah. if, if this continues to work and it has been working way better than people want to admit, I mean, yeah. it, it's been a decent enough offense. So I just don't see why they would just switch things up all of a sudden. If you just look at like early down, like um, EPA per play, Atlanta's like their top five right now. Once yeah. you adjust for schedule, like they've been efficient. It might not have been like, the way you'd want it to go, right. but they've been efficient. Their late down success rate is also pretty good. Like they're not a bad offense. It's the right. defense being an outlier, like just doggy do. Yep. Like that's the reason they're losing football games. The yep. defense It's not the rush heavy approach. And it, that's why we should expect that to continue going forward as well. Yep. So projecting like 15 pass attempts for Mariota at most this week as four point favorites against Carolina. Yeah, basically. Now let's dig into some situations you are targeting for this week. Again, if you haven't listened to the show before, just kind of running through a situations, maybe fluid right now where you may think even the props may be not posted yet. You may find some value once they are up. Which situations are you keying in on for week eight? I think there's three backfields that are interesting. I mean, usually these these situations are backfield related. Uh, you can look at the Jets first. I mean, Brees Hall obviously out for the year with that torn ACL. Uh, James Robinson just got there, but he's had some knee soreness, and and it sounds like they're going to take it slow regardless, uh, Robert Sala said. So uh, I'm expecting to see Michael Carter as the main back in that backfield, mm -hmm. but don't sleep on a guy like Ty Johnson because – you know, clearly the Jets don't see Michael Carter as a bell cow every down back. Otherwise, they wouldn't have gone and traded for James Robinson in the first place if they did see that. So I do think Michael Carter's the 1A in that offense. Um, but I, I would uh, assume that this week we're going to see more Ty Johnson than we typically will once James Robinson is fully, uh, you know, into this offense and, and ready to go. So that's one backfield. Another one, uh, Dallas doesn't sound good for Zeke at this point. Um, the last time that he missed a game because he just plays all the time, even if he's injured. Uh, but the last time that he missed a game, the same coaching staff in 2020, uh, Tony, they, they gave Tony Pollard a 75% running back rush share. He had a 28% target share in that game. It was the best game of his career against the 49ers yeah. uh, in that contest. And, and fantasy managers might remember that he was the RB one overall that week in PPR formats. Um, so I, I do think that, that even though Tony Pollard isn't built like a bell cow, um, you know, they might not give him like 20 plus carries, but, uh, you know, he, he's going to be on the field a lot when he's on the field a lot, he's going to see a higher target share as a result of that. So that's something to, to keep an eye on in that backfield. And then the last one is the Denver one. I think this Mike Boone going on IR thing is sort of slipping under the radar. I don't think enough people are really like factoring that in because, you know, last week he didn't play a full snap share cause he got it hurt. Uh, but in week six, he played just eight fewer snaps than Latavius Murray. That was that game where Melvin Gordon didn't play a whole lot. Uh, they were facing the Chargers. They went to overtime, all that stuff. Uh, but Mike Boone also ran 12 routes in that game. Uh, he, he's, he had been running as a pass catcher for that offense. So I'm very intrigued by both Latavius Murray and Melvin Gordon. I think Gordon's probably going to take on a lot more receiving work. Um, so that's at least something to keep an eye on uh, here against Jacksonville. This is like a bad comp because it's going to say like, oh, this team is like this team. But it is reminiscent in a way of the 2017 Saints where you had Alvin Kamara in the backfield. You was No, it wasn't Latavius. It was Mark Ingram and Adrian Ingram. Peterson as the other two guys. And like, yeah, it's a frustrating situation. But you remove one piece from a three-headed backfield, 
that's a pretty major change. Yeah. So I think that that is important, especially with Boone getting all the, the late down work in that offense. That actually does change things quite a bit. So I'd agree. Melvin Gordon most likely to be the pass catching guy as a result of that change. And it is in a situation like that. It is actually very important when one guy is taken out of that fold. Okay, let's turn our attention over to yardage props. What are you seeing on the board entering week number eight in that regard? Yeah, so I got three bets for you. The first one, David Montgomery's line across books right now is seven and a half receiving yards. I'm going to hit the over there. Um, You know, obviously, uh, you know, over the last couple of games, he's only seen one target, but he's still run a decent number of routes in that offense. Uh, He played more third downs than Khalil Herbert last week. And in games where both guys have played this year, Montgomery's played about 60% of their third down snaps. So uh, he's been on the field on third down, which is good to see. Um, he still ran more routes than Khalil Herbert last week, despite only seeing, despite not seeing a target. Um, he's now hit the over uh, of the seven and a half receiving yards in four of five full games played this season. Um, you know, the, the last week was the first time that, that he didn't reach it. Um, you could see a negative game script against Dallas that should force more passing. Um, but I should note, I, there, there is one thing I want to say here, and this is why I think the line is where it's at. Dallas, obviously a good front. Um, and they've been really good against limiting running back targets this season. They're actually third best uh, or or worst, however you want to look at it, um, uh, in, in adjusted target share allowed to the running back position. Uh, but I do still think, I mean, this is a, a one reception type situation for David Montgomery. If he's able to catch the ball once, uh, he should be able to hit the over there. Um, another one, this is going back to a player I talked about last week and fortunately got the W with it, but it's Robert Tunyon. Um, you know, last week he got that that garbage last reception and he got like 21 yards on it, but he was still under that half 30 a and a half mark. <laughs> and once again, across books, he's at 32 and a half yards. And I like the under once again, um, the bills have been very, very good against tight ends this year. They rank as the eighth toughest opponent and adjusted target share allowed to the position. Uh, the tight ends that have hit this number uh, against the bills, Zach Gentry was one of them because the Steelers dropped back 52 times uh, or, you know, they threw 52 <laughs> passes against Buffalo. The other two were Tyler Higby and Travis Kelsey both of whom had double digit targets against the bills. I don't know if we're going to see that, uh, you know, for Robert Tunyon and, and obviously Gentry was able to, to hit that mark because they threw a lot. So that was a, a very much a volume type play. Uh, Tunyon has hit the over uh, on this three times this season. So, you know, he's, he's, he's been there for sure. Um, but I, I really think that, uh, that this matchup dictates them number one, not being able to throw the ball very well uh, in general. And this offense just not moving the ball very well, similar to what we saw last week, but um, I, I just don't think that it's a, a great matchup overall. Um, so I'm going to hit the under with Robert Tunyon at 32 and a half yards. And then the last one, um, again, you can get this line uh, in a lot of spots, but AJ Brown, uh, his line is at 66 and a half receiving yards. And I like the over for AJ Brown. Um, you know, despite being a bad football team, the Steelers have actually faced a pretty average pass rate against this season. So I'm not really that, that concerned about Philly just going with this like insane, insane uh, run scripts uh, offensively. Um, you know, the Steelers have a below average pass defense in terms of success rate allowed. AJ Brown has seen at least 21% of Philadelphia's targets in every single game this year. So that's a, a floor for him so far this year is a 21% target share. 54% of wide receivers this season that have had a 21% target share have hit the over uh, with this mark. have hit that 66 and a half number. And that's his low. That's his minimum. Oh, and by the way, it's AJ Brown. You know, we're not, we're, we're, we're talking about one of the best wide receivers in the game. Uh, who's one of the most efficient per target historically. Um, so I really like the over at 66 and a half. I think you could probably bet that up to like 70 yards or so. And that sample you cited with the target shares includes some of the like the Falcons teams and the Bears mm-hmm. teams we discuss. Like it's not adjusting. And like the the Eagles are run heavy when they're ahead, but they, you know, they're not that bad. They're not that run heavy right. uh, by any means. I think that that one uh, definitely makes a lot of sense there for AJ Brown. Other thing too with that is they've had some pretty conservative approaches recently with a low eight on approach, but part of that might've been weather Jordan. My missed a game and a half lane Johnson missed half a game. Now both my and Johnson are healthy. That could allow them to potentially open things back up. I'm not sure if I really want to bank on that, but you probably don't need to for AJ yeah. Brown at six, six and a half for sure. Let's shift our attention now to the touchdown props for week. Number eight, where are you seeing value at FanDuel Sportsbook in the touchdown market? Yeah, so the last time I talked about this guy, he scored a touchdown. It was one of the few, uh, you know, touchdown props that have really got my way this year uh, on this on this show, at least. Um, but I, I do like Cortland Sutton over on FanDuel. He's plus two twenty as an anytime touchdown scorer. 
He's he's still one of the biggest touchdown regression candidates uh, in the league right now. He has one touchdown this year, but he has over 450 receiving yards, and he's tied for first in the NFL in end zone targets. Um, he's had about a 25% target share in this Denver offense. Russell Wilson's back. We know that he's favored Cortland Sutton within this offense. Uh, Jacksonville has the 11th worst success rate against quarterbacks this year. So I think it's a, a decent enough spot where this juice makes sense to, to, to go after Sutton at plus 220. So I like Cortland Sutton over on FanDuel plus 220. And then Justin Fields. I'm going to hit the under 0.5 passing touchdowns for Justin Fields. You're getting some juice there. It's at, at plus 145 over on DK. Uh, Fields is playing better. Uh, but this matchup on paper is just absolutely brutal for the Chicago Bears. They've struggled up front, as we know. Uh, you know, they're they're not great at protecting the quarterback. Dallas has the best pressure rate in the NFL. I mean, they can get to the quarterback. Um, the Cowboys have allowed less than one passing touchdown per game this year, so they're at least getting close to that half a touchdown mark. Uh, Fields himself has hit the under in three of seven games this season. Um, you know, Chicago's been the most run heavy team in football, even in negative game scripts, as I talked about. Their implied total is just 16 and a half points. So I, I think that that is very, very possible that that Justin Fields is under here. I would I would look at this more as like a 50-50 uh, type scenario for Fields as opposed to what the odds that you're getting right now are a lot more favorable than that. Yeah, plus 145, as you mentioned, the under for Justin Fields at 0.5 passing touchdowns. And the key is there is passing touchdowns. He yes. can run for one and it doesn't matter. Uh, and like they have Herbert, they've got Montgomery. Like there are a lot of paths to unders here. Like they could just not score as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. So there are paths to unders there. Going back to Sutton, uh, do the Russ high knees in the in the plane factor into your projections for a Cortland Sutton anytime touchdown? Yeah, look, everything Russ factors into my projections, including that including his horrific play on the field this season. Um, you know, it's, it's all of that, Jim. And I am, I am look, look, put it, placing a bet on anything Denver offense is frightening, but I do yeah. think that that plus 220 number is pretty attractive. So if he scores a touchdown, you've got extra cash to burn because you have the plus 220. Will you pledge right now on air to eat a danger witch if Cortland Sutton scores an anytime touchdown on Sunday? Never, never. Okay. I might do that for you. I might, uh, I might hold up your, yeah, you're the, the subway here. guy. I'm not the subway. Guy. We don't talk about that in public. You know, it's, <laughs> we keep that under wraps, especially with the rust rust things. You know, sometimes I, I gotta keep my cancelable cancelable takes to myself. And I yeah. think that's getting pretty dang close, yeah, but probably. maybe I'll, uh, get a danger, witch on air. If we, uh, hit the sudden prop for a second time already through week number eight. That is JJ Zacharyson. Check him out on Twitter at Late Round QB. You can find his work uh, at LateRound.com and also on the Late Round Fantasy Football Podcast. JJ, delight to have you on as always. Happy Halloween to you uh, and good luck to you in week eight. Any plans for you uh, for Halloween dress up this year? Yeah, of course. All, all, always. Uh, my family and I are dressing up as Encanto characters. So I will be Bruno okay. and there will be pictures of it on Twitter, on Twitter I'm sure. Okay, at Late Round QB to get the Bruno pictures. JJ, have fun, and we will talk to you again next week. Thanks, Jim. All righty. Do not forget to check out our other podcasts from this week, our NFL Week 8 breakdown and our College Football Week 9 preview, both up on the Covering the Spread podcast feed and over on the FanDuel YouTube page. I am on Twitter at Jim Sonnes, J-I-M-S-A-N-N-E-S. You can also follow the FanDuel Podcast Network at FanDuel Podcast. Big thank you to everyone for tuning in throughout this week. Good luck with your bets. We'll talk to you once again Monday to get you set for Monday Night Football. This has been Covering the Spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network. 